Guten Morgen. Uh, is this thing on? No? You hear me anyway, okay. That's normal. Is this thing on? Okay, now I think this thing is on. Okay, very good. Uh, so, Guten Morgen. I am Jonathan, and uh, I... I think in the Perl world we are quite uh, adept at taking things from other languages and stealing them uh, into uh, into Perl, and this is, is a long, long tradition of us doing that uh, in in many, like probably every version of Perl. Uh, this this tradition, of course, continues into Perl six, but sometimes we innovate. Sometimes we come up with something new and interesting and we lead the way. And uh, what I want to talk about this morning is one of those things that uh, appears in Perl 6, and uh, that is uh, a, a, a feature um, exposed by three keywords, uh, react, supply, and whenever. So what are they? Mm -hmm. I have a very simple answer to that. OK, are you ready for this? It took a long time to formulate this. They are just a mechanism for consuming zero or more asynchronous streams, often called reactive streams, providing concurrency control through one message at a time processing, automatically handling error and completion propagation, while managing subscriptions with the option of producing a new stream of values as a result. Do you have any questions? <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you, Sean. OK. Yeah, OK, it's a little bit early, isn't it, for that? It's a little bit early. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about for loops instead. That seems easier, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is how one looks in Pulse 6. OK, and uh, what do we have here? Well, uh, this thing here that appears after the for is an iterable data source. It is something where we can go to it and say, give me a value. And then when we want another value, we say, give me another value. And for each value that we get from that source of data, we pull one. We uh, run this block of code here. So uh, we're just uh, passing it into this, uh, this block, which takes line as a parameter there, which gets the scoping nice and clear. And that's very good. Um, and then we pull another value. And then we run the block again. And we pull another value, and we run the block again. And uh, eventually, we get a value that says, this is the end. And we say, OK. And uh, there we go. So these run in lockstep. So we, uh, we pull one value, and then we run the block. And then we pull one value, and we run the block. And we don't pull the next value until we have run this code. And we, uh, we don't uh, run this code until the value is available. Okay, And this all sounds very obvious. And uh, you might think, why, why is he telling us this? And the answer is because I'm about to show you a world where things are very different. Okay, and it's, uh, it's nice to, to see that. But uh, one of the other features of this, what happens if we lose interest and we have an iterator object hanging around? It's fine. We just let go of it. It floats off into the sky, and the garbage collector eats it. Okay, That's nice. And uh, when does the next statement after a for loop run? When we finish doing the loop. So, uh, OK, that, that seems uh, fairly reasonable. And it, this pattern, this pattern of iteration, shows up everywhere. Um, this is, in some ways, the heart of synchronous programming of streams, okay, where a stream is a source of data that we can move through a bit at a time. And when you have a, the, an implementation of this pattern in your language, you can iterate pretty much anything like that. So of course, the obvious example is to move through an array, or move through a hash table, or something like that. Um, but we can also use it to read lines lazily from a file. In fact, that's what the example is doing here. And uh, we pull one line from the file, we process it, we get another. So if it's a million or 100 million line file, we're not getting it all into memory at once. That's pretty nice. Um, or we could be reading rows from a database. And if we're doing that, we know that we, we wait for the row to come over, the, over the, uh, the socket or whatever. We get it. OK, we look at it. And maybe some more rows come later. And uh, whenever we 
we don't have the data, we, we pay the cost or we wait for it to be produced. But actually, we can walk anything like this. We can uh, make a generator and uh, walk any data structure that we would like, uh, exposing a, an iterative interface to it. Okay, so uh, this is useful. This shows up in a lot of places. What about asynchronous programming, though? Asynchronous programming is, is kind of different. Um, now, one of the language features that we've seen very widespread for asynchronous programming in a lot of languages is async await. And the idea of that mechanism is we have an operation, we set it off, and the operation uh, runs somewhere, and it does some work, and then when it completes, the code resumes after the await. And the idea is that the await lets us almost pretend we're writing synchronous code because our program is paused there, but actually um, we're not really pausing it. We're freeing up the thread that that code runs on to do something else. That's very good for single values. But a lot of asynchronous data is not a single result. Okay, if I make a web request, it's one result. If I read a, a configuration file in the background, it's one result. But lots of things are many results. If I run an asynchronous process, okay, I spawn a subprocess, I call some program, and it writes out data to standard out, standard error, I have to be really careful traditionally if I do this, right? Because if I go and try to read from standard out, but the program is only doing stuff on standard error, eventually it'll stop because it'll fill its output buffer on standard error and we didn't read it yet. So if we start with standard error first, then we make a mess with the programs that are doing standard out instead. Um, so really, we want to deal with this asynchronously. Uh, to, uh, you know, we, we need to have some way of saying, well, just, just read from them both at the same time, and whenever something comes from one or the other of them, um, just, just react to it. If I have a socket, all right, I'm writing a web server or something, data is coming over the wire whenever it comes. I don't choose when the data arrives, it, it just arrives over a socket. We have ticks of a timer, okay, so it ticks every second. That's, uh, that's just uh, a set of values, a stream of values that are the ticks of time. If I have a user interface, some graphical user interface, when does the user click the button? Whenever they want, okay? That's another asynchronous stream. Um, message queue messages are probably a more obvious one. Um, and uh, business or domain events. So if, if I, uh, I have some, some uh, business application and some event happens, you know, like we get a new order, Okay, we can have a stream of those events. When do they happen? Oh, whenever someone orders them. All of these sorts of things are asynchronous streams of events. And this is not something you can so neatly deal with, with things like uh, uh, async await. Um, they, they kind of want something else. So at some point, I, I did this, this thought experiment. And uh, this is a background to this. I used to, to teach um, re reactive and uh, reactive stream programming quite a bit. And I taught it uh, mostly to C-sharp programmers. And I, it was very interesting watching the sorts of things they had trouble with and what was difficult. And that kind of inspired me to think, how, how can we do better at this problem in Pulse 6? Um, so this is kind of where I started. What if we were to have a loop-like construct for asynchronous streams, what would it look like? So let's imagine that this time we have an asynchronous process here, and I can get some reactive stream of values. So that isn't that I wait for a value. Instead, what happens is the values just come whenever the process outputs them. So instead of this being an iterable data source, it's what I call an observable data source. That's the observer pattern where we go and we say to something, hey, I'm interested in when these things happen. And then whenever those things happen, it tells you, okay? It's like you subscribe. So what would have to happen is when we start the iteration, iteration, okay, observation maybe, we subscribe to those events. We say, I'm interested to know what happens. And whenever an event happens, whenever we get a line or the timer ticks, or the user clicks a button, or whatever we're doing, we run this block to handle the event. 
Okay, it looks terribly like a loop. Just, just a bit of a different mechanism for the setup. And uh, we, we don't uh, you know, trigger anything explicitly. It, it always happens when the event arrives. So events can occur anytime on any thread, potentially after a subscription. When we lose interest, it's a little bit different with the observer pattern, because uh, when we iterate, we obtain an iterator, we ask it for values, we let go of it, and it's garbage collectible. But here, we subscribed at the start. So something that produces events holds a reference to us. So when we break out of this thing, we need to unsubscribe. We need to say, I don't want these events anymore. And that's a little bit different, too. And this question I, uh, I struggled with for quite a long time. What, uh, when do we run the next statement if this is an asynchronous loop? Hmm. Hmm. That, that's interesting. That's interesting. But if we could have something like this and we could figure out a good set of semantics, this is actually the really important thing in language design. People are always thinking about syntax. Okay? Syntax is, of course, important. <laughs> But the semantics are like 10 times more important, and they get about a tenth of the discussion. Okay, but they're, they're what really matter. Um, that's, that's how do things behave. And it, there's no point having beautiful syntax and then having completely broken semantics behind it. So uh, this needed quite a bit of thought. And there's, there's a few other things that might worry us here. Um, this is any thread. Okay, so suppose I, I have things that can arrive from any thread. We'll need a concurrency control mechanism, okay? Some some kind of way of dealing with that. Um, so if we we get two events at the same time, we we probably don't want to you know just just trample over our state that we're working with. This one is also pretty thorny. I mean, we could effectively await the end of the stream. That would that would be one way of doing things. But if we do that. What if we actually want to process many asynchronous streams? Like with the process, where we have standard out and standard error, and we want to do both. Hmm. That, that, that implies we want the other thing. We, uh, we want it just to continue so we can make another subscription, but then how do we keep control of all of those subscriptions? So this is, uh, is kind of interesting. So, so here is the, uh, the, the answer to, to what we, we came up with in Pulse X. Okay? We did end up with an async loop construct that looks exactly like what I just showed you. And the keyword for it is whenever, because asynchronous data arrives whenever. Okay? So, and it reads kind of nicely. Okay? Whenever the process is standard out, gives us lines, run this code. So it subscribes to the stream when we do a whenever. It runs the body on each event. And then it unsubscribes on this last. And uh, OK, that seems all right. But whenever never exists on its own. Because whenever is only establishing the subscriptions, but we need some way of keeping track of them all. And that, those some things, and it turns out we needed two of them, really are called React and Supply. So this is how you might use them together. This is the, the simplest way you could do it. So what I'm doing here is I have a observable, okay, a supply. Supply is the Perl 6 type for a observable or reactive or asynchronous stream of values. Those get turn, uh, thrown around quite interchangeably. And this is going to give us a tick every second. And then we just say, if uh, the current value divides into two, OK, that, that looks a bit like the module operator, but it's doubled up. It actually gives you back true and false. So it means, does, does, this, uh, does two go into this? Say tick or talk. And when there's 10 of them, then we're done. So this just establishes the subscription, and execution continues. And the React says, ah. Wait until that whenever stream ends. Now, React is like a lot of statement prefixes in Perl 6. It can take a statement form, or it can take a block form. And when we have the block form, 
we can subscribe to multiple things inside of it, and they all attach to the same enclosing React. So we can add another whenever here. So whenever sets up a subscription and says what to do each time an event like that occurs, and React manages the whole set of subscriptions. Let's have a look at a more practical example. So this is a, a kind of pretty uh, one. And uh, let me show you what it does before I explain the code. OK, so uh, this is the one. So I've got a program here called Color Handles. OK, and uh, it works a little bit like uh, Xargs. I run it, and then I give it another program that it should run. So I say, OK, run the, uh, this Perl 6 program that picks standard out or standard error at random, uh, says what handle. Uh, and does that 10 times. And uh, if I run this, then uh, oh, is it really random? Oh, OK, I guess it's, I'm suspicious about this randomness. But OK, oh, OK, I'm relieved. What are the chances? <laughs> Maybe I should, should go and play the lottery today or something. I really should. OK, so, so what it's doing is it's coloring the uh, standard error in the yellow and standard out in green. So this is the program that does it. So I have a main subroutine. And uh, I've used units to, uh, to fit this on the slide with bigger text. Okay, uh, That just, just means the rest of this program is the main subroutine. That can be kind of useful. And we just take the name of the program to run. And the other command-like arguments, we slurp up. That's what the star means. Then we make a React block. We create an asynchronous process. And then I have some whenevers. And I say, whenever there's a line from standard out, output it but colored green. Whenever there's a line from standard error, output it but colored yellow. Then we'll start the process. And whenever it ends, exit with the exit code. Okay. And we're done. That's, uh, that works just as I showed you. Okay, and uh, no worrying about you know, which handle to read from and all of that. The things just come as they come. We deal with them, and there we go. OK, that wasn't too bad. Now, here, my program terminates when, whenever this one terminates, and I just pass on the exit code. But actually, one of the really useful things about React is that it terminates when there's no outstanding subscriptions left. And this is very, very useful because there's been, there's been times where um, I've been doing async stuff and actually the hard problem is, are we done yet? And you start trying to establish like counters of how many things we still are working on and then we decrement them and, yeah, and then we, we forget somewhere and on an error path and then the thing doesn't work or something. Um, so it's, it's annoying enough to have to do that uh, we kind of would like it to be tracked for us. So what I'd like to build now is something, we'll just build on this running processes, but what I'd like to write now is something that runs a set of test files and collects all that output and envelopes it. And we'd like to run them in parallel. So what we're going to do is we'll have a degree, that's how many test files that we're going to run at a time. We're going to then uh, find all the files that we would like to run. And here comes the nice fun stuff inside of the React, OK? So we have a, we'll run four of these at a time. I'm going to have a subroutine called run one, which is going to run one test. And at the start of my React block, I'm going to call run one for up to degree times. So that's just setting off the first batch of four tests. And inside of run one, we will uh, run the test collect its output, and whenever something we have run ends, we'll start another one. And that means we'll always have uh, four, uh, in this case, active tests at a time until we get to the end, and then the last few just dribble away. Okay, So let's take a look at this particular bit of the code. First of all, we'll uh, shift a test off this uh, list of tests to run. And if we don't get one, we'll just return. That means we don't have any more tests to run. 
Otherwise, this is a lot like the code that I showed you before. Few differences. This time, instead of outputting the stuff straight away, we're just collecting the output. Okay, and we're prefixing it with where it came from. So here we're saying we ran this test file, we got this line from standard out, we got this line from standard error, we got this exit code, and then when we are finished running that test file, we just join all of those lines together and output them. Okay, and that's the, what I mean by the enveloping of it. And the reason that we want to do this is because we'll run a whole load of tests uh, in parallel, and then we'll just group the output of each one and send that along to whatever is uh, interested in it. And we actually have a script very, very much like this uh, in the, uh, the Pulsex uh, comma integrated development environment, which we use to do the parallel test running. So this is actually quite a, a real world example. And then what happens here when the process is exited and we have all the lines? Huh, we'll run one more. Okay. What the one of the things you'll notice about this is that the whenevers do not have to be directly within the React. In fact, we can put them inside of a, uh, a subroutine and call that. So React whenever is a very dynamic construct. We can add a subscription whenever we want. In fact, you can put a whenever inside of a whenever, which you might do if you're writing some kind of server where you get connections, that's the outer whenever, and the inner whenever is processing the data that comes from each connection. So this, this dynamicity of this construct is, is one of the very powerful things about it. We don't have a predefined set of subscriptions. We can just add new ones, and they come and they go. And when we eventually have run out of them, the React block ends. That's nice. Okay. Interesting question. Audience question time. Is this call here to run one actually recursive? You think not? Yes, exactly. Okay. Because yeah, so, so uh, the answer was yes. The correct answer that was given was that because we're just subscribing here and this code will run at the point that the process ends, okay, then it's not a, it's not a, uh, a recursive call because we ran run one, we set up all of these subscriptions, remember control continues straight afterwards. We set up our 10 subscriptions, uh, uh, sorry, our four subscriptions here, okay, fall out of this block, we finish being inside of the run one subroutine, and it's only later on when we get this event handle and that we call it again. Okay, so yes, it's not actually recursive even if it kind of looks like it. It's kind of interesting though that uh, synchrony, uh, actual synchrony is sort of achieved by uh, something that looks like recursion, and there's probably something quite deep going on there. So, each whenever subscribes and tells the enclosing React about it, React terminates when all the subscriptions are over. Hmm, next problem. Okay. Arrays are not uh, thread safe things. What about concurrency control? Okay. And uh, React is not just about doing termination. Uh, and uh, completion management. It also is about concurrency control. And there's quite a simple rule. React processes one event at a time, and that applies across all of the whenevers that are within it. So whenever I get an event, if I'm currently processing one from some other whenever block, or in the same whenever block, probably some other one, then we won't go on and process it until the current event has been completely processed. And the setup phase is also considered as an initial event. So if I go back to here, 
here's what happens. We enter the React block. That's a subroutine, so nothing happens. We call run1, and we are doing it in a loop. We enter run1, we make a process, we uh, set up three subscriptions. Then we fall out of it. Now, then we do it again. Imagine that the process we started immediately starts sending us some data. Actually, we won't process that straight away until we have finished running through this and setting up all of our various handlers. Finally, we have set up all of these, uh, these whenevers for four processes. We fall out of the, uh, the bottom of the block. Now we have all of the subscriptions. So now we're ready. And say a, a line comes from standard out of one of the processes. We'll process it. If while we're doing that, another one comes okay, from a, a different process, it'll just hold on a moment. Then we'll process it. So what we're getting here is essentially actor-like semantics, where we process one message at a time across all of these blocks. And that means that any state that you declare inside of your React block is implicitly protected. Okay? And the setup phase is basically like your, your zero event. And that, that can be really important because sometimes you actually want to make sure that you have set up a bunch of uh, subscriptions before you then continue onwards processing any messages from them. You may, um, of, of, of co yeah, in this example, not. Because, because yeah, correct, correct, so yes. Um, I mean, in this case, the array is declared outside, but React, uh, it runs. It's running synchronously with, or we're, we're waiting for it to be done. Yes. So, but in general, don't do it. Yeah, if you're, yes, in, in general, and I'll show you another construct soon called supply, and there the answer would be don't do it. But with React, yeah, this is, this is pretty safe. Um, yeah, so you, uh, yeah, you, you maybe need to be careful with those things. A defensive copy is, of course, a safe thing to do as well. But it is safe. Please. Uh, because you start, that call actually does start the process. Yes, because it returns a promise. And the promise is kept when the process ends. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's exactly. Windows users will get this perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Ah. So I have one more question. Probably the last one for today. Can we factor out this enveloping part somehow? Hmm. That, that is a good one. Okay. So here's another, another thing to think about. If React is a tiny bit like 4, because we, uh, you know, we, we, we wait for all of the stuff to be done before proceeding, and we just do it for its side effects, what is the equivalent of map, okay, where actually we would like to produce a sequence of results for each thing? And uh, that's a supply block. Okay, so React is for processing one or more events, uh, streams of events, and doing side effects based on them. Supply is about consuming one or more, or maybe zero or more, streams of events and producing a new stream of events, a new reactive stream as a result. So supply is for reactive processing of data. This is how it looks. Okay, it looks a lot like React, but the behavior is a bit different. So supply doesn't actually do anything in the immediate. You can see the return type here is of type supply. And what we're doing here is we're saying here is a bit of logic 
that can process these various different events. But we won't actually do anything straight away. We just hand back a supply object. And then, whenever we subscribe to that supply, at that point, we will run the code inside of the supply block. So if you think about it, it is a bit like each time we subscribe, we make a new subscription or a new instance of this supply block. So when I subscribe to this thing, then it will go and do all of the free subscriptions here. And instead of us doing some kind of output, we say emit. And emit means I want to send a value, I want to push a value to whatever is subscribed to me. So this is a way that we can, in this case, take three different asynchronous streams and merge them into one. How do we use it? We just call envelope process, we pass the process in, and we just say, oh, whenever. And this time, we just push it into the array. Now, we, ha we have a, a little bit of a, a challenge here, um, because how do we know when the process ends? Let's go back a moment and look at this. A supply block also has the same termination rules as a React block. When there's no subscriptions left, it's over. And emit is just one of the events that we, uh, we send. This is the I have a value. But there's also done. And done indicates that there's not going to be anything else. And when we run out of subscriptions, it passes on done. Then we know that it's the last iteration of the loop. And just like in for loops, where we have this last block, which runs on the last iteration of the for loop, here it runs on the last iteration of, or well, iteration, observation, I guess, of a value. Okay? So when we get told, okay, it's the end, then we put the output of the process that we enveloped, and we run one more. So, uh, okay, that's, uh, that, that's kind of nice. So this runs at the stream end. Okay. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty useful. It's, it's also nice that it's, uh, it's a bit different in behavior because it's a reactive thing, but it's very much like the same thing you would do in a loop, uh, an, iterate, an iterative loop. OK, so one last thing. Now that we have this working, let's try and do a timeout for hanging processes. How can we do that? It turns out that we, we could actually write a timeout mechanism uh, that's very generic, that isn't even specific to the code that we're writing here. So the first thing I'm going to do is declare a new exception type. We'll call it x timeout. It's quite common to put uh, exceptions under the x namespace in Peltex, which is inherit from exception. And then I'm going to write a subroutine that takes a source supply, that is a source of observable events, takes a number of seconds, and we're going to produce a new supply. And here's what we want to do. We want to pass on values, but if a certain number of seconds have elapsed, then we just throw an exception. So pass on values is easy. Okay, We just say, whenever the source gives us a value, emit the value. Then. Whenever this number of seconds have elapsed, throw that exception. Now, if you die, if you throw an exception, or have an exception thrown somewhere inside an asynchronous block, like this, what it will actually do is propagate that on to the thing that is subscribed to it. So errors are also pushed downstream. Okay. So the general principle is that uh, the thing that wants the values also gets to deal with problems producing them. And this is what we expect in synchronous programming, too. If I call a subroutine and it can't produce me a value because it gets an exception, okay, the caller gets it. That's why with await, when we await a single asynchronous result, okay, we get the exception where we wanted the result. 
And it's the same here with reactive streams. The, the error gets pushed down the stream to the thing that was uh, hoping to have the data. Now, there's a slight problem in here. Okay, anyone notice that? We'll always uh, wait for this timeout thing, even if the, the process ends. Okay, because we, we have those nice termination semantics that were so useful to us before. But now they, uh, they kind of get in our way, right? Because what will happen, we'll go through all of this, we'll uh, have finished the process, but unfortunately our, our timer didn't fire yet. So, uh, ah. so what we'll do, so remember the, the, the last keyword that I used before, um, when you're in a loop, okay, it terminates the current loop you're in, lowercase last. Done terminates all subscriptions in the current supply or react block. So done means unsubscribe from this. Okay, we've put it with last, so we're already unsubscribing anyway. And that means that we have done with this whole supply block and we will convey completion onwards to whatever is subscribed. So here is how we use it. We call envelope process. That gives us back the supply of the prefixed messages coming out of the process. We feed that into timeout. Things put a timeout of, say, two seconds. That's not very generous. But, uh, OK. So what will happen is uh, whenever we timeout, an exception will be pushed into this whenever. Now, at the moment, we're not handling that exception, which means that it will actually be uh, cause all of the subscriptions to be uh, canceled, and the exception will be rethrown. Remember, this could have happened on any thread. It will be rethrown where we wrote the React block. Okay, so we, we don't ever lose the asynchronous errors here. Now, of course, in this case, we don't want to do that. We actually want to catch it and handle it. So when we, uh, we get the exception, okay, it's coming in asynchronously, and we actually let us distinguish synchronous and asynchronous exceptions. And the mechanism for an asynchronous one is called quit. So when we get a timeout, okay, and the reason for the typed exception is because we only actually want to handle that particular case in this way. We don't handle any error and pretend it's a timeout. Okay. So you say, when we get a timeout, kill the process that we spawned, because uh, it's been running too long, get rid of it. Push a timeout message onto the, uh, the output, produce the output, and then run one more thing. And uh, that's how we can do the timeout. Now, hmm, that looks like duplicated code to me. There we are. Pull it out into a subroutine. Subroutines, by the way, are always lexically scoped in Pulse 6 by default. So uh, that just works out very naturally. Okay, it, uh, it will close over the correct uh, output. So that all just works. And uh, we're done. There we have it. Okay. So in summary, whenever is essentially like a loop, but for asynchronous data. But because we normally care about processing more than just one item or one stream of asynchronous data, we need some kind of surrounding context for this. This attaches to React or Supply, where React is about doing side effects and waiting for everything to be done. And Supply is about creating an event processor that will produce a new stream of events that we can subscribe to. Together, these provide some common features. They provide concurrency control by processing one message at a time. They provide completion and error propagation in the very same way. Inside of a whenever, it works just like a loop. You can do uh, last. You can do next. You can use the, uh, the last uh, phaser, the uppercase, to run something when the last observation or the last event is done just like the last iteration in a for loop. 
And we have another keyword because we last just terminate one subscription, the current whenever, we get a new built-in called done, which terminates all of the subscriptions in, within that React or supply. And remember, React uh, is, is just something that we do now. Supply is a little bit like creating an instance, and each time we subscribe to it, that is when we start the flow of events. Or in other words, okay, it's a mechanism for consuming zero or more asynchronous streams by writing a whenever for each of them, providing concurrency control by letting us process one message at a time only and making the others wait a little bit until it's their turn, automatically handling error and completion propagation so when all of the things are done, okay, the surrounding React ends. If one of them crashes and we don't handle it, okay, it also all comes to an end. And we have the option with supply of instead of just doing side effects, of producing a new stream of values as a result. And hopefully now this uh, makes a bit more sense. Okay, so thank you very much. I'll be uh, happy to... I may have a minute or two for questions. Could, sorry, could you put the React block inside of? Could you put a React block inside of whenever? Yes. However, and you might want this, you might want this, or you might not. Um, what it will mean is that nothing in the outer React block can process another message until the inner one is done. Okay, and sometimes that's what you want. Um, but yep, so you, you could do it, it would just work, but they don't have a relationship beyond the fact that your, um, your React block, when it hits on the inside of the whenever, will mean that that outer React block can't, basically it doesn't give up its, uh, its concurrency control. Okay, so uh, you, you would have to wait. The way you, that you might deal with that, if you actually wanted to, um, to sort of set off another React block and then do something when it is done but have it run uh, asynchronously, is put in a start, okay? And then that gets you back a, a promise and then you can say whenever that is done. Um, so you have a choice, but by default you will get the, uh, the, the safe um, blocking semantics. Actually, I haven't talked about this, but it's actually quite an important part of the model here that when you send a message, you push a reactive message through the pipeline, you pay its processing costs, okay? And uh, that means there's a back pressure mechanism so that we, we don't ha end up with super fast producers overwhelming downstream consumers that are much, much slower. And that is why you would, you would get that, uh, that blocking unless you, you tried otherwise. Okay, anything more? Please. Yeah. Uh, in all your examples, you have the dot run one because the inside, the declared inside of the React block, right? Yes. Uh, if so, uh, what if you have a more complex design and you want to try to go server inside different objects or methods of objects? Yeah, so the whenever must be lexically inside of the React block. Um, and the reason for that is that actually we can do a lot more analysis of programs doing that. Um, and we can, for example, if we, if we have a React block and we can statically see that it only subscribes to one data source, we can get rid of all the concurrency control uh, that we need. And this is, this is very important optimization. It gets you like an order of magnitude better throughput almost. Um, so that's nice. If you want to factor things out, that is why I showed you the supply thing, okay? And what you would tend to do is factor out your different handlers into some other subroutine elsewhere that has a supply block, and then inside of that, uh, you, would, you would just call that subroutine, okay, get the supply block and, and consume that. And generally, I think you don't really, you know, you, if, if you are trying to write a single React, and it is going to deal with you know, 20 different subscriptions. That, that's too much for anyone to understand. So um, breaking it out into subparts, each inside of their own supply block, which handles some of those events, 
and then you know aggregates them or whatever, and then they're dealt with by the uh, the inner one, the the React block at the end. Um, that's that that's the the intended factoring of this. Um, yeah, actually, one has, any, has anyone used Crow at all or played with Crow? The uh, yeah, I see a few hands. Okay, Crow is actually just d built. It's it's a uh, a web. Uh, well, it, it's for building web servers and basically any servers. Um, and it works entirely by having a chain of supply blocks. So we have one supply block that processes uh, passing HTTP. Okay, and then we have one which does the routing and runs a handler, and then we have one which serializes the HTTP response. And middleware is just a, another supply block shoved in there somewhere, which is, uh, is quite pretty. Um, and yeah, we factored out that complex problem of processing you know, web requests into a, a set of components that are each reactive. Yep. Yes. Yeah, and, and we do. Um, it's it's not the default, of course. But yeah, uh, what what you need to do there is, um, it, I mean, the the thing is that if you uh, if if we just take an example here, okay, when I do a whenever, I establish a subscription. The only thing that I then uh, will ever be blocked on inside of this React block is when I get a message out of that subscription. If that subscription, that, that subscription will go off and run asynchronously. Okay, it'll, it'll start, it'll set up its subscribers. It's only at the point that it sends a message into this React block that it's done. So actually, a anything that you do a whenever on, it, gets it, it, it can live its own life. So if I have a web server, and I have a React block that's receiving connections, and I have a supply that handles a particular connection, all I do is just subscribe to it, and when it finally closes or when it gets an error or something, I'll know about it, but otherwise I'm not blocked on all of the processing inside of that. Yeah, yeah, and, and then you're just keeping track of the active connections through the subscription thing. It's what, sorry? Yes. Correct, it's not. Yes, yeah, it's not, yeah, it's not recursive. But yes, that. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's correct. That, that's how it works. And, that, and, that, and because whenever is, no, it's just a subscription. I think we have one more and then maybe, I think it can be you, yes. I, I, I can't see behind you either. My eyesight is too bad. So so the, the the question as I, as I understood it is yeah. so I've mentioned that we have this model of send the pays for processing costs. Um, and we use that in order to get some back pressure. So the question was, if we have multiple, I guess, threads, perhaps producing events, and they both are pushing a message onwards, of course, they, they will run up until the point where they contend. They will run. Um, now, what happens when they contend? Actually, you don't block a real thread. What you actually do is just like what a weight does. Okay, you, you basically say, oh, well, we're trying to send this message and we have all this logic on the stack, but actually we'll just you know, shove it off. Something else can run on this thread and we'll resume it later. Um, so actually, yeah, you can, you can have like you know, 500 outstanding uh, things to be processed somewhere and just run it all over a couple of physical threads. And I think that's maybe what you were asking. Yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah, or even one thread, yes. Yeah. Yep. 
Okay, and they probably, yeah, I should stop talking now, but if you have any more questions, feel free to come to me afterwards. I'll hang around a bit. Thank you very much. And, uh,